Καλησπέρα σε όλους. Ε, αυτή είναι η χητική... Ε, welcome to everyone. I speak, I speak in Greek. You know, Greek and English. Um, this like uh, sound I created like I was in a conference last week uh, in Italy in uh, Verona, and I just got this idea of um, using this sound for um, the entry entry part of the of the talk. Um, I have been using um, micro front ends for um, a year now. Um, I I live and work in London. Um, I'm, um, I'm an organizer of uh, CTJS. I, I started CTJS about seven years ago, uh, initially in London, and then uh, it took over uh, around the world. And uh, in about a month and a half, I'll be doing it in Athens, Greece. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a senior developer. And I work for Foolproof. Uh, I think this is my next slide, probably. But uh, let me check one second. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I I have this uh, idea about um, about the project that I did uh, over uh, one year and a half ago. Uh, it was a project that I worked with Turbo Pack, uh, Module Federation, and um, um, and I've been working with. Uh, I didn't have experience with RS Pack. So it's something that came up um, in. Um, I think it was October 25th, um, to, about a year and a half ago, with um, Versil announced that they are switching from uh, from uh, Webpack to uh, TurboPack. Uh, at this point, uh, it was after a month I gave a talk in uh, React Alicante about um, a module federation that it was using Webpack. So I thought like, oh my God, you know, suddenly, they are switching now to TurboPack. What's TurboPack? Um, then, um, you know, it's great to be at uh, Code Week and discuss about all these kind of things. And we're going to go through a bit about what the project uh, was about, uh, what are the, what were the difficulties. As I said in the beginning, I'm an organizer of CTJS. I do talk in conferences. Uh, I have a, a working experience of about 20 years. In the in the development, um, I started doing like .NET. Then I moved to more front end roles, and uh, I've been working with JavaScript for quite a while now. Um, I want to show this video. I saw it last year in a number of conferences. And uh, some people that I don't know how many people in the audience are from the '90s, or they have uh, seen adverts from the '90s. But this is an advert that some of you you might uh, recognize and you remember that um, in your um, in your youth so yeah you have to know greek of course so there are two teams one is in uh, villa riba and the other one is in villa bajo uh, one team is using fairy liquid sorry i didn't mean to bring like a promotion in this talk <laughs> Um, I don't have anything, I don't get paid from Ferry anyways. So yeah, uh, in Villa Riva, even with cold water, they were able to complete the clear all the pieces and everything. Well, in Villa Baja, they were not able. Okay, somebody, I saw that last week and somebody asked me, like, oh, why you chosen this ad? Well, um, it's just an example of two teams working with different tools. One team was using Ferry and the other one was not using it. So there is always like a secret ingredient that we have to use in our uh, in our uh, in our development. Uh, if you don't know Luca, Luca Mezalira is uh, one of my friends. Um, he is a pioneer in micro frontends. Uh, about two years ago, maybe more, he written a book about micro front ends with O'Reilly, and he was explaining how um, how micro front ends work. Uh, with some of the parts that I'm gonna go through the talk, I'm gonna be explaining um, what are the micro front ends, how they are, uh, how they can be uh, implemented. Um, this is a actually a semi real picture. Uh, I just took with my mobile phone Luca in uh, the conference last week. I was in uh, in Verona, Italy, and I just put with uh, like a 
and fancy to a fairy liquid in his hands. Some people, they did think it, it was a real uh, fairy liquid, but it's, it's not. And what micro front ends can do, they can share, they don't share their runtime. Um, the teams are very independent. They can use um, uh, their, the same framework, but they don't have to have the same code base. Um, that independence can be can increase the speed of development and how we develop uh, code in general. Um, they don't have to rely on a shared state and global values. They are completely independent. Um, so the <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about it has to do with um, the project that we did in uh, my in the company I work in London. I work for a design consultancy uh, studio in London. The, the name is Foolproof. Um, I'd have said about Foolproof, and they also, uh, if you search Google, there is a movie called Foolproof. So, yeah, not that movie, but the actual company. Um, the, while I was working for the, the project, uh, we got a client request. So when you work in a consultancy, clients come in, they say that, okay, we need you to develop uh, the solution. We would like you to develop the solution using uh, micro front ends. Uh, we would like to deploy the solution in Vercel. Um, Vercel is a hosting environment. I don't know if you have heard about Jamstack or um, another solution could be Netlify, or uh, there is uh, the classic AWS and uh, Azure. So th this company that just wanted to deploy th the application in, in Vercel. They wanted to use design systems and they wanted to use Next.js and React. I just, um, um, before I start using this, uh, this uh, application, I, um, I, always, I was always a big fan of uh, module federation and I did enjoy the, uh, the use of a module federation. Um, working now with uh, this solution, we had to, the module federation was not working in Vercel environment at that point, so we have to use something else. So because we're using Vercel, uh, Vercel is using Next.js, and then the new version of Next.js is uh, Toolbobak, we have to use Toolbobak. So the, the, we have to find, um, but I'm still a big fan of module federation but it doesn't work on that environment so we have we sometimes we have to go with what works and over the time we can prove that this is not really the the best solution and with i mean if you have done mathematics you know about the proof by contradiction where you have to to prove something going backwards in a way that that's that that's what happened and that's what we're going to talk about. So, yeah, that project was about uh, 12 months um, um, started. Uh, our team in the design agency, uh, it's a, quite a Greek team, which I'm very proud about it. Uh, Nikitas and Panos. Um, we we even built a, like a React Native app. It, it was quite a lot of uh, heavy loaded development. Um, so, going back to um, uh, micro frontends, there are two, two versions of micro frontends. One version is um, uh, the horizontal uh, approach. Basically, in the horizontal, you can have, uh, let's say, uh, one page. And then every part of the micro frontend, every one of these components that we normally see in a, in a page, it can be a separate app, a micro front end app. So the header is one app, the product details is another app, the product carousel is another app, the footer is another app. Teams can work independently on these apps. So you can have a header app uh, the team C is working while the product details team A is working. And then you can see team B is working on the product carousel and the team C is, uh, so in one, Page that we what we normally think of um, a spa a single page application. You can have a, you can break it down into smaller apps, 
you, that's the horizontal way of doing it. There is a vertical way of doing it. If you have like, if you think that one team is working on one page, the other team is working on the other page. So while we are choosing the solution, we have to choose, uh, we have to uh, think of a number of architectural uh, decisions. We have to decide about how is the technical debt is going to work? How, what is going to be the performance? Is this scalable? And the, one of the biggest um, pains in the development is the node modules. So we have to take into consideration, um, OK, one thing to mention, for example, is uh, I have a team of three developers. Is MicroFrontends a good thing for me? Maybe not, because MicroFrontends would work for a really large team. But you might want to go to a bigger size team. So you might want to start early with a really big um, size uh, architecture and uh, being able to scale over the future. So maybe that's a good thing to think of. Um, then performance is how the application is loading. Um, scalability could also work if, you know, how, um, because there is a conversation about um, having a, the, the old server single page applications, they're more considered as a single page applications. And when you deploy those applications, you deploy them as a monolith. So basically you de deploy the whole application as one. All the, all the pages, all the routes, and, and, and everything, basically. And that's like a, a, what we call a monolith. When you deploy micro front end, you deploy each micro front end independently, which means that you don't have that sort of um, big, um, uh, big bulk of uh, app that you have to, de to deploy for the whole thing. So you just deploy each one piece of the app independently. Um, then you have to think of, okay, how does the micro front ends um, uh, work? How they are um, broken into pieces? So do they share dependencies? How does, it, how does this work? So um, the, the TurboVac solution that we've chosen, and uh, after my, my uh, talk, you can get the slides and you can, um, you can also click on this uh, uh, GitHub repo that is provided by Vercel. Don't try to use it because it doesn't work. I had to, to modify a few things to make that work. And I can do provide, though, the GitHub repo for you to download the code. Um, what are the, the, so yeah, just to make it a bit more funny, I just said, what are the pros and cons? Like, um, uh, if you like food, um, you're going to like this kind of metaphor. And um, the, the, the pros are, the vert it's a vertical solution only. And can deploy it in Vercel. I don't know how it's going to work if you try to deploy this this application in AWS or in Amplify. Uh, there there are a lot of problems with setting dependencies, and how uh, the implementation can be tested. That it, we had to do a lot of uh, configuration. There are a lot of duplication of configuration of code. The code is very dependent on Vercel frequency of uh, updates. And there is a lot of um, uh, included tech debt because of um, the how Next.js it's it's expanding and it's creating new new features. So you have to always keep track of the new features that come from Next.js. And um, this is like a small demo I did for um, like that conference I went. So you can see here that we have this page that um, basically. It, it's there is one one uh, application that is going to be called the host. It's the host app, and then that the host app it has the micro front ends. So the the when you, when we are in this page, um, you can see that uh, whenever we click on docs, we are actually um, loading the docs app. 
because I just told you that this is a vertical solution. And it loads the, the micro front end on, um, as a vertical, as, a next, as another page. Uh, you can see that this page um, loads from 3001 slash docs. But when we click it on the actual um, uh, host environment, it, it just loads from um, 3000 slash docs. What means it's just um, imagine that it's like an iframe where you're just bringing the docs up inside the host application, but they both use the same uh, domain. Um, it's just uh, they are able to root the, the micro front end apps um, inside your app. So um, going next. I can show you a bit about how the, the structure of that project is. Um, so for example, the, the project that we built in, a, this is a dummy project, it's not the actual project because we cannot reveal the client's names and we, it's foreign, you know, it's very um, like a secret. So I just created the same app, but it's just a small app as an example of the, of the app we built. So um, this is the whole project. And then inside the, that whole project, you have a folder called apps. In the folder apps, you have a docs, docs app. It's the, the docs app that I, I just told you about. So with that loads in 3001. And main, it's the host app that loads on 3000. Now what happens is um, docs app is going to load inside main. And we could create eventually many more apps and they could be hosted through main. I hope you got a good uh, idea of how micro front ends work. Um, so additionally to that, we have created another folder structure where it's uh, packages, where we can have um, a, a design system uh, pages that we share between micro front ends, a storybook application that it can be used for um, creating generic components and displaying them and preview them with the stakeholders. Uh, there is also a uh, utils folder that you can have uh, your Apollo client or GraphQL. And there is also an ESLint. So all this, what we have in packages, they can be shared by the the micro front ends um, apps. What we have to do is to not to, to make this very generic, but not to change them too often. Because you are loading these um, shared components as, um, as dependencies to micro front ends, and you want to reduce how many changes you're going to be making to those. Um, so yeah, if we open the design system, we can see that we have a button, we have a quote. So these are the like some components that we can uh, just create and then reuse them in micro front ends. If you have components that they are specific to, let's say it's a, it's a booking button, which booking button is only specific to the booking application. Then you create a component inside the booking micro front end and not to the generic uh, design system. So this is a, like, a, uh, like a diagram of how our micro front end um, architecture will look like for this kind of solution. So you have the apps folder where you have the main app, you have the booking app, you have the register app, and they are all hosted inside the main app. And then uh, all these, they use the same uh, packages, the same uh, storybook. We were using the speedy web compiler, which is uh, something that has been created in Rust. Um, and the, inside the utils, we were having authentication uh, libraries, um, Apollo and GraphQL that they were, they were used by all of micro front ends. <clears throat> Issue number one. So while we're developing this, 
uh, we, we went through a lot of problems where uh, we were creating something on the micro front end and it was not possible to, to be resolved. So you need to, to you need to uh, configure the your um, uh, module mappers to be able to detect uh, the the files from your uh, micro front end with all the other uh, uh, projects that you are um, using the dependency. So when we were using um, uh, components from uh, utils inside our micro front end. We have to do, uh, we have to configure certain mappings to be able to use uh, those kind of shared components. So we were getting these kind of messages. Additionally, when we were doing testing, we had to do a lot more um, um, configuration uh, for um, uh, you know how the. Um, Let's say you are testing on the micro front end level, and how then you can be testing inside the, the dependency that it's been used within the micro front end. And so that um, that was quite a bit ugly kind of thing to do, and um, it it made us you know. And every time you were creating a new micro front end, you have to copy the same kind of um, uh, the same kind of uh, configurations which was not really productive. Well, that made me think of, um, do we still need to use, um, a, you know, probably Turbopack was not a great solution, um, but, you know, I could go back to Webpack when using it with uh, Module Federation. And I mean, there were a lot of uh, prongs like the vertical solution, the horizontal solution, setting modules between um, the master app and the and the and the micro front end app that you were uh, you were using within the master app uh, the plugins for the design systems and testing that uh, i will show you um, a great video after um, but yeah webpack was getting quite old it was very slow and um, the configuration could, could be quite of a pain so yeah, this video, you, you know, I don't think we have time to watch the whole thing, but this is a, a great video, you can watch it later. It's about Storybook and um, using Web Federation plugin and, um, and how you can uh, create it something which is called Federated Design Systems, a, a great kind of idea. Um, we can speak a bit about more about module federation and how does it work and this is like an example of um, of um, uh, the configuration file so you can see here that um, also one thing to mention is that module federation supports SSR so if you're using nextjs you can also use the get server get server side props and you can uh, you can make uh, Node.js calls. You can load things from uh, SSR. So it's a, a great tool. But uh, if we go back here, you can see that we have the home app, which is the the, the host app, and then you have the orders app and the items catalog. And you are uh, you are uh, saying that this home app is going to run on three thousand one, where this one is going to run on three thousand two where this one, the item catalog is going to run on, um, on, on I think they, you know, you could say that on, yeah, it's on 3000. So you, I mean, probably, um, yeah, it could be the other way around, but yeah, you can understand that one app is running on 3000 and then the other two apps that we are loading inside, they're gonna be running on the 3001 and 3002. We are like, it's like a kind of teleportation where you just, uh, bring the 3001 and 3002 apps inside the 3000. Um, which means that teams can still work on, um, on these independent apps like the home and the orders. But then the actual end result is going to be used in the, um, in the item catalog, which runs on 3000. Um, another, another thing to go through is that um, we can see that this app is loading, is exposing uh, certain components like the nav and the pages map and the home. So that's, they are getting exposed to 
all the all the other apps and it's setting dependence so it says that i'm gonna run this app it's a react app and so the host app um, uh, if it doesn't have a uh, react um, the micro front end can share the, the react dependency or any other type of dependency to the mic to the host app and it can run the app on um, on that level so there i mean if you are uh, using um, if you don't want to use webpack you can still use uh, vit uh, vit has been developed by the creator of uh, vue.js um, actually he's going to be speaking in my conference in uh, singapore in uh, about uh, three months in july um, so this the idea of vit is that uh, you have uh, the application bundling and um, using um, uh, browser ES modules. And the, on, the, on some websites, they say that it doesn't require to be bundled, but um, uh, speaking with some people, they told me that it's still bundling on production. Uh, it leverages you know, the modern features like uh, native ES modules that's supported by browsers. Uh, and it can be very fast, it can be simpler, it uses a lot of standards, so those are the prones. Um, it, in the Chrome extension, it will slow down Vit in development. The code splitting is low in production, so because of rollup. Um, the browser supports some all the browsers that might not be supporting it. There are challenges in large in larger projects. Um, so yeah, this if you click here later, you can see an example of, of using Vit for that uh, development. Um, and I mean, one of the latest um, solutions in um, the bundlers world is RSPAC. So the creator of Module Federation is actually working for a company called ByteDance. ByteDance. Um, is um, it took took hired him after um, the conference uh, last year in London, the CTJS conference in London, and ever since they also inherited all of his uh, all his open source work. Uh, it is um, ten times faster than a Webpack. It's a very good solution for the people that work with Webpack and they want to carry on working um, uh, with the same kind of features and plugins that you use in Webpack. It has been developed by a big, uh, by a large company, so you, you know it's it's quite safe. Uh, it has a really large ecosystem, and it's been, um, uh, the, you know, the ASM built output that you saw in Vit, it's, in a, it's a work in progress. It's a very good video to watch as well, this one, where uh, it explains how you can use RSPAC with Moodle Federation. One really good thing about this is that uh, you can use, uh, you can have a micro front end that adds, adds React on the root, and you can import uh, another micro front end that adds view. It's like mind, blow, mind blowing uh, kind of thing. So yeah, it, what's this one? It's really cool. Um, after after a certain time, uh, Guillermo Routes, he came back and he said that uh, they are they are uh, accept they are start working with uh, module federation. It's not exactly the, it's creating a proprietary version of module federation, but it's in a good uh, in the right in the right direction. Okay, let me go fast now because we hit thirty minutes. And so um, they are very good. It's it's a great solution. Um, it it might not be the the great fit for. Uh, someone that has a small team, but it will be a very good thing if you want to scale and if you want to go like, to a really large uh, team. It, it has increased complexity. We saw that a bit uh, in my slides. Um, and But to do that, to solve this kind of problem, you have to have unit and end-to-end -end testing. Uh, there is an operational overhead, so you, you can use Datadog or New Relic or um, uh, Sentry. Uh, duplication of code, uh, well, they can be duplication of code, you saw it in that turbo pack, but you need to have good code reviews, sharing of libraries when needed. 
uh, you have to have a good team coordination, uh, which means you have to have a really good contract of who is developing what, you know, how it's been developed and where, uh, from who. Uh, and a very good API contract maintenance means like the remote types, automatic updates of the contract, they are very well defined. And that's all for me. And yeah, if you want to see me again, I'll be in, uh, at CTJS Athens uh, between 6 and 8. And this is a QR code for a 20% off. And thank you very much. I don't know if I have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. So yeah, thank you. I hope to see you all again in the future. Um, any questions, just follow me. My Twitter also is Aris Marco with a C. So yeah, um, I'm going to share my slide and you can um, you can take over um, all the, the links with, uh, with the library search and uh, um, with CSS. Um, I mean, we developed everything in the in the storybook, in the design system, and then it gets shared to to the micro front ends. But you, um, that's what I mean. The design system feature was, but you can also you can also have independent. Um, I mean, the theme should be the same for all the micro front ends. But if there is needs to be, if something is different from one to the other, you might have it inside the micro front ends. So it's about decision of how you want to uh, architect it. Any other questions? Um, I mean, uh, we are not uh, recruiting, uh, I mean, Greeks, uh, but we're recruiting uh, from all over the world. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, uh, with, you know, um, not in my, in my company, you know, but in general, that's not something we can discuss offline, I guess. <laughs> 